few years ago, um, another architect friend of mine uh, recommended him and, you know, he said, you know, you, you should really think about insurance. And I was kind of like, oh, I'm doing my thing. It's like, you know, kind of like in the back of my mind. And then I was working on a project and the client was really upset. And I, at this time I was only doing the permit expediting and he was, he was upset with the civil engineer, wasn't returning his call or something like that. And so the client's on the phone with me and he says, if he doesn't return my call, I'm suing everyone on this project. And I was like, ew, <laughs> I think it's about time for me to really consider some insurance because it made me realize like I could be exposed to some things that I didn't, you know, that I didn't know about. And so um, I, uh, so then I took my friend's recommendation and, and uh, gave John a call and he was, and was and has been so wonderful in explaining um, what my policy is for, what it's about, what, what the details are. Anytime I have a question about, you know, something in particular, um, I can ask him and is more than willing to take the time to explain it to me. Um, helped me with, because I, I had kind of like a little template that I was using. And he was like, oh, you're just opening yourself up to so much exposure. And I didn't even realize it. And explain to me, here's what you're saying. Here's what could happen. Here's how we're going to change it. And so by the time we went through that process, I felt so much uh, stronger uh, in, in, my, in my position um, to know that if, uh, as you were saying before, John, if there's some sort of emotional claim, you know, or something like that, that, I, that I'm not just kind of pulled into some, into a bad situation. And then also um, last year was the first time that I decided to terminate a client and I'd never done that before. And it can be really scary because you don't know kind of if they're gonna freak out you know, or, or what, what that means. And so I was just so thankful that I could call John and say, look, this is the situation and to make sure that I knew that I was protected. So, uh, so I never feel like I have to stay on a job that is detrimental to me some, you know, somehow. And at the same time, I can make sure that if I am working on something and you know, there could be like a client or a consultant or someone who's trying to get me to do something that's not you know, um, wise for me, it, I, I just love that I can call him and, and kind of talk through things with him. So I'm, I think he's wonderful. And so I just want to, to share, I want him to share his knowledge uh, with, with our group. Well, thank you. <laughs> I hope everyone, this is, um, this is John Feeney. I've been in the business for a while. When I got into the business, I was a tennis player that was playing a tournament. And I'm the guy who I played. I didn't have a job, just getting ready to graduate. He ran an insurance brokerage. And I said to myself, the last thing I want to do is be an insurance broker. When I learned more about what he did, I realized that this could be interesting. He also told me, I hate to say it this way, he also told me that the competition isn't all that great because not a lot of people want to go in insurance and you know you you could do pretty well so when i got into the business i never really looked back i've been in the insurance ever since but i'm a, a technician at heart and i always get upset with salespeople because salespeople look to sell and don't necessarily know exactly what they're selling so when i got into the business i got in on the insurance company side and literally learned what every endorsement meant how to put policies together and how to rate the policies. And before I became an underwriter, I had to pass a test for memory, how to rate glass insurance, how to rate building insurance, how to rate auto insurance. So when you learn the nuts and bolts of it, it becomes you know, truly interesting. So I'm kind of on a mission from God to, to make everyone realize that this is a profession out here. So we'll go into some of the details about the type of insurance coverage that you purchase. But one of the things I want to start out with is saying that what you do on your side isn't that much different from the insurance company side. And here's what I mean by that. Your insurance policy is written to be, to cover to be determined claim situations. So they're, they're reasonably broad. So everything in an insurance policy is, is there for a reason. And just like your agreements, your professional service agreements that you write, everything in there is to, to address to be determined situations. Maybe not everything in your agreement will come into play, but if it does, you want to make sure you're protected. Mm -hmm. So when you buy an insurance policy, you want to make sure that you've got as broad of coverage as you can for situations that could blow up on you. And you know what is the right limit, for example? Uh, what is the right deductible? 
you know, what is the right insurance company? Um, it's been it's been said to me a number of times that the best insurance brokers out there are like paparazzi. You know, they they follow people around. They get to know what's going on. They know who's at a company, they know who left the company. They know the history of the person in the company. They know whether they're, you know, their first answer is no versus yes, and you kind of go from there. But we'll go into my proposal, and this is I just titled this 10 Winning Tactics to Making Intelligent Choices When Purchasing Business Insurance." And it might be a little bit different than your approach was before, but let's let's go into it. I'm, my name is John Feeney with IOA Insurance Services, and I'm going to just quickly move forward here. IOA Insurance Services is, depending on what records you look at, we're top 15 largest broker in the United States. Our home office is based in Florida, but our, our architect and engineer team is out of California. As a company, we service over 5,000 architect and engineer insurance needs in California and 11,000 nationwide. I'm personally in, uh, working with clients from Mississippi to California. And my background, as you can kind of read here, is that at least at this point in time, I had 700 clients. I'm more than that now. But I, I do a lot of speeches, and, and that's mainly – to let you make you think a little bit about your insurance policies, make it make you realize that these policies actually mean something to you rather than just a piece of paper on a wall. And personally, one of the reasons I like working with small companies is because I get to talk to the people that actually care about their business. When I work with larger companies, I'm talking to the to this the accounting department. I'm just another widget on the shelf, and I never get to speak to the owners of the company. So today's a really good opportunity to talk to people that actually run their businesses and might be concerned about some of these topics, but may never have had these discussions before. I'm going to back up one slide. I am on LinkedIn, and LinkedIn's been a really nice resource for me. There's 2,800 California firms that follow me, and if we connected on LinkedIn, I send things out that, you know, you don't have to call me up for anything. You'll just kind of be in the, in the loop about things that might be of interest to you. I, I don't spam at all. I just kind of put things out there that I think are, are interesting. If there's nothing that's uh, good to show, then I, I just don't bring it up. So key concept about insurance. This is hugely important. You know, I have clients that say, why is this company's price $10,000 and the other one's $6,000? Well, here's the reason right here, simple on this page. Your insurance premium always equals 65% of every dollar they collect is paid claims. 30% is internal expenses. Insurance brokers generally make 15% commission, just like every business is out there to make 15% profit margin. The companies have a 15% internal expenses, and the insurance companies are allowed to make a 5% profit margin. So... This is kind of a different approach maybe when you think about your policy, but realistically, whatever your premium is from an insurance company, this is how it breaks down. Every three years, insurance companies have to report to all 50 state separately insurance regulators what their premium information is in that state and what they paid. And if their loss ratio goes down to you know, 50%, they have to reduce their price to get it back up to 65% loss ratio. If their loss ratio goes above 65%, red flags go off. They have to increase their price. So the insurance companies, when they work with the regulators, like, for example, in California, which I used to work with a lot of them, and when I moved to California, I was in charge of a half a billion dollars of premium for Fireman's Fund Insurance, and I work with regulators in all 50 states. So when we talk to them, we show them, we meet these formulas, and in return, the state is a guarantor in case we go out of business. They'll replace us as an insurance company. As a fact of life, that doesn't happen too often, but for those of us that have good short memories, when the crisis hit, the, save, the housing crisis hit, AIG, the largest insurance company in the world, went out of business overnight. So the state insurance department stepped in to make good for AIG's commitments to all their policyholders. So this is, is something where the regulators come in to try to keep insurance companies solvent. So when you have a claim, when you have your pricing, let's just say that uh, Travelers was $10,000 and Hanover was $7,000. It means that Travelers paid more claims than Hanover did. That could be just roll the dice. You know, they had some bad experience with claims versus the other company. Or the alternative could be, and this is where the paparazzi stuff comes in, Does one comp do both companies, are they both equally user-friendly when claims occur? Or does one take a really tough stance and people just give up, and that's why their loss ratio is less? 
So when you buy from an insurance company, this is the formal that goes into play, but behind the scenes, that paid claims is huge. So your insurance broker should have a clue a bit about who's a little bit easier to work with, and uh, sometimes paying a higher premium might be worth it. If you know you've, been, you've, maxed, you've got your, all your credits that you're due and, and you've contained your debits, might be worth paying a little bit more if you know that one company is a little tougher to work with if a claim occurs versus the other, or at least you're prepared in advance. But it's, this is the form list, something to keep in mind. So we're going to get into the architect and engineer, what I call core insurance policies. Core insurance policies are most often put into play when you ever you get a professional service agreement and you see what their insurance requirements are in there. So this is professional liability insurance. The reason it's called professional liability in the business world versus errors and omissions, any policy that's called professional liability means that you as a business have unlimited personal liability. I've faced unlimited personal liability when I used to be the insurance broker for the Mortgage Bankers Association of America when that crisis hit. And what happened there was when you have personal liability, that means that they can take your savings, your house, your home, a lien on your earnings. That's what professional liability means. It's unlimited liability. So the people that have unlimited liability in the business world are architects, engineers, board of directors, accountants, lawyers, and physicians. Mm -hmm. So the policies are titled professional liability for that reason. So what does professional liability do? This is an overly simplified part of it, but it protects your firm from claims from your professional service activities. There's three coverages that come into play. It's bodily injury, property damage, and economic loss. I spent a lot of time in Lloyd's of London, and I was talking to somebody about what is the history of architect and engineer policies. And it was really interesting. I talked to a guy who was like 90 years old who was there, and he said, well, I believe it was. Somebody came in and said we wanted to insure uh, architect and engineer, and there's no policy there. And they talked about what they do, and the underwriter said, eh, I think I can take a physician's policy and make it an architect and engineer one. And if you think about it, you have something in common with them. If a physician doesn't do their job right, you know, they, someone gets hurt, they can't work, they suffer what we call economic loss. If they don't do their job right, people suffer bodily injury. You know, so physician policy has a lot in common with you because of the fact that, you know, they can hurt somebody, plus they can financially hurt somebody from an economic loss perspective. So your policy covers bodily injury, property damage, economic loss. Bodily injury, wall falls on somebody, somebody's hurt. Property damage, crack in a wall. Uh, home collapses, got to replace the wall. Economic loss, you know, they're, they just, uh, people can't open their businesses up. They're, they're down for a while because of this problem. That's the economic loss side of it. It differs from the other type of policy that you buy. I'm going to call it business office policy. It's like a homeowner's policy, but for your business. And from a liability perspective, the most important coverage in there is called commercial general liability. It's the flip side of professional liability. Professional liability covers professional service activities. Commercial general liability covers non-professional service activities. And if you look on this chart that I have up here, you'll, you'll, you won't see economic loss in there. You'll see bodily injury and property damage. And it applies on a, and professional liability applies on a claims made basis. I got some examples of this later, so I won't talk about this until we get to the slide. Uh, business office policy. It's like a homeowner's policy. If you work out of your home, your homeowner's policy does you no good whatsoever. So, and if you do work out of your home and your homeowner's policy, your homeowner's insurer found out that you were running an architectural practice out of your home, they would cancel your policy because they don't like covering businesses in a home. So this, this commercial general liability coverage in a business office policy is relevant for your home, but it's more relevant for things that happen outside your business. So it combines several coverages in, in a single policy, just like your homeowner's policy does. If someone trips and falls, that's liability insurance. If someone you know, steals your bicycle, that's property insurance. Just a little different way of phrasing it when we get into architects and engineers. So with commercial general liability insurance, this is the second bullet point here, just right there, it, it covers... It's, think of it a book, a book with four chapters in it. It's the easiest way to think. I only use three of the chapters here because of the, the time. But the first chapter is liability that occurs on your premises. That's within your office. The second chapter is operations liability. And the best way to explain it is it covers 
while your while construction operations are going on. So while that's on, that flips into the second chapter of this book. The third chapter is called Completed Operations. So that's after construction operations have been completed. The fourth chapter is called Products Liability. You have no exposure for it. Products Liability is what your professional liability policy is. So if we if we go into the operations liability just a little bit, someone gets you go to a job site for construction observation. When you're at that job site, you can be held accountable because of your pro professional training for not recognizing unsafe conditions. It's unfair, but that's what the law holds you guys up to. Not in every state, but California for sure. So if you see something that's dangerous at a job site, if it's not imminent danger, then you go upstream to go back downstream. You go up to your project owner, tell them you saw something out there, you, you think it could be dangerous, but they should communicate with their construction contractor just to try to resolve it or take a look at it. If it's imminent danger, then you have a duty to let the person at that job site know that you think this is dangerous and they really should do something about it, and then you go back and document your file, go upstream to go back downstream again. When you're at a job site, this is just something that's not insurance-related, but whatever your tick list is, when you go at a job site, add to it, did I see anything unsafe? If you want to protect yourself from a claim, commercial general liability, operations type of claim, you want to have on your tick list, did I see anything unsafe? If that's a normal part of your business practices, you, if you get named in a lawsuit like that, you can say, yes, I was out there this day. I didn't see anything that was unsafe, or I did see something that was unsafe, but I went upstream to go back downstream. I can't do any more than that. And that's how you can get out of one of those claims. But if you don't keep track of things like that when you go out to the job site, when you get named in a lawsuit, they have no idea what day you were out there. So you just get named in this lawsuit. And the, the easiest way to protect yourself from these type of claims is document your file. Uh, completed operations is, is things that when the building is put to its intended use. I'll give you a good example. We lived in Illinois before moving here to California. And we did a teardown rebuild of our house, came back after six months, and about two and a half years after we moved out, there was a crack in the wall. It was bowing out a little bit. That crack in the wall was caused some great concern. I happened to be in the insurance business, so I didn't just rush to hire some attorney, but that doesn't mean your clients won't. One of the things I tell my all my clients is, you know who your project owner is, but you don't know who your project owner's attorney is. You know, so in the situation where there's a crack in the wall, some people may call up their attorney and you get sued. When you get named in a lawsuit like that, is it professional liability? Was it your design that created the crack in the wall? Or was it the means and methods of the contractor that just didn't brace the wall quite right? Completed operations claims are one of the main reasons why you never want to be in business without getting commercial general liability, which is in a business office policy. This is the big ticket item right here. It's the black hole of Calcutta. Is it uh, professional liability or is it commercial general liability? So in our situation in Illinois, the contractor came in and they cut a hole in the wall and they went back there. They found the bracing had slipped a little bit and they had to, to basically pry the wall back and they, they fixed it. But, you know, we could have easily have brought in our architect, We could have brought in our structural. We could have brought in everybody in a lawsuit. And what would have been in their defense? You know, this policy, if it wasn't, if it was strictly related to the means and methods of the contractor, if other, if, all their work was followed properly, except for the fact that the contractor, you know, when they took your instruments of service, they put their plans together, they make it a reality. Um, they made a mistake. You get dragged into it. So for business office policies, there's special architect and engineer programs. So not every Tom, Dick, and Harry policy out there is a good one. People that think about this have a little better policies out there. I'll give you an example. State Farm Insurance. Everyone knows State Farm. Everyone knows Kaiser in, in California. Kaiser will not work with State Farm. They will not accept the State Farm policy. And the reason they won't is, is um, the policy that's put out by State Farm excludes completed operations liability. That's the big ticket item. They don't cover it. So Kaiser knows that, and they won't accept the policy. So most of the policies that you would buy would have all these coverages in there, but it's important to know whether it's in there. And that's why if you have a broker that's, that's attuned to what's going on, they'll have a clue on this. Going to the next slide, selecting your insurance broker. How do you go about doing that? There's a lot of brokers out there. So what does a broker do? Your broker should assist you in, in identifying what your exposures are and solutions. 
everyone tries to do that. Do they really know that? So you have to kind of, I'll give you some ideas about how to think about it. So, and also the insurance broker should know how to position your business activities through the use of applications and attachments to applications. So you know that you get a good hearing in court, that you get the maximum credits that you can get. And that if you're going to get a debit, they're unavoidable, but just make sure it's not too big of a debit. So it's communications. So your application is, is how you give information to the broker to help them be a better broker for you. So if you have a broker that gives you advice on how to do that, it's a lot easier. But if your broker doesn't, just think about it. You're answering a question in an application, and if your mind says, that doesn't say the whole story for me, put an attachment on there and add a little extra information. That will really help. Your broker should be an experienced negotiator. So you should ask your broker, how many firms do you represent like mine? And if they don't represent too many, they don't know your business. You know, so it's nice if you can find a broker that actually focuses on your business because repetition makes for you know pretty good experience. And there are brokers out there that do a pretty good job of this. There's a couple trade associations that brokers that focus on architects and engineers belong to. And one of them is called AE Pronet. That's the uh, association that we belong to. And the other one is called PLAN, P-L-A-N. Between those two broker associations, we handle probably 30% of all architect and engineer policies in the entire United States. So those two designations kind of gives you a tip that you're working with a broker that actually has some frequency of thinking about your business. If they don't belong to one of those trade associations, they are probably a bit of a dabbler. They'll, they'll try to help you, but they just don't have enough business to warrant belonging to that kind of trade association. The other thing is, how many insurance companies do they work with? So this is a two-edged sword. They can say, I work with you know, 80 companies. And you can say, great, 80 companies. How many do you talk to you directly versus you have to find somebody as an intermediary to negotiate for me? I have, if anyone has any questions, my email address, I can send you a list, a one-page thing that I usually give out at every speech I do that tells you the specific questions to ask a broker to figure out in advance whether they really make sense for you or not. Today, we don't have enough time for that. So the role of the broker, like I mentioned before, you're kind of like um, paparazzi, so we need to know the pros and cons of the insurance company. You know, How good is their policy? How good are they when you have a claim? Uh, can they help you with your making your contracts more insurable? Most insurance companies don't really do a good job of that because they don't want to practice law. But there's a, we represent 46 professional liability insurance companies. I'm a Catholic boy, so I describe them as heaven, purgatory, and hell companies. The heaven companies do a pretty good job on the risk management side. The purgatory, eh, lip service. The hell companies, cold day in hell to help you there. They just don't put the resources in it. So you need to know which companies, what categories they fall in. You know, do you, are you getting a quote from a heaven company, a purgatory company, or a hell company? Your brokers, ones that know what's going on, they'll be able to explain that to you. Um, claim services. Um, the brokers should have a clue about who are good attorneys when it comes to handling claims. I'm going to give you a truism about lawyers. When I was an underwriter, I put a lawyers program nationwide together as an underwriter. I've looked at over 5,000 applications, and I can tell you with certainty that almost all lawyers do three things. They do tax work, corporate work, and estate. Notice I didn't say insurance defense work. Yet lawyer programs from an insurance company perspective are really hard to make money in, and it's because lawyers don't turn down billable hours. So if you ask them to help you, they will help you. They may be ducks out of water, they may, but they may not. most of them are, that they'll try to help you. So how do they help you? Go on the Internet, find things. That, that looks good to me. So an insurance broker should have a clue about who some good lawyers are that could help you, and there are ones in California. You know, We have 40 million people. We also have some pretty, pretty good attorneys here, but not every attorney knows what's going on. Your brokers can help you on that. That's probably something you may not have thought about before. From a, I get into this risk management advisor from an insurance and non-insurance perspective. I will tell you that part of the reason that a good broker gets better pricing is the insurance company trusts that broker when they send an application that those answers are correct, that the, that the broker has correctly portrayed how that, that client works. 
that the broker, apart from selling an insurance policy, really wants to kick the tires on what your contract looks like, what your professional service contract looks like. If they don't ask that question, it's not good because your contract covers to be determined situations that could go wrong, just like your insurance policy does. So the really good brokers out there can help you make your contract more insurable. Uh, certificates are huge in the architect and engineer world. I know our company did about a million certificates of insurance by August. That's a lot of certificates. Certificates are also kind of a case of where's Waldo? So if a certificate goes out and it's not done right, yep, got to do it again. Not done right, yep, got to do it again. So if a, a broker is experienced with what you need on a certificate, they're going to know what endorsements to put on it and how to phrase who's covered on that certificate so it doesn't bounce back and forth many times. Uh, good brokers also, you know, don't disappear when a claim occurs. Good brokers get involved in the claim process, trying to, one, trying to help you in the case the insurance company picks an attorney that isn't all that great to say, yeah, there's somebody better. You think we can work with this person? Or if there's a, usually when you have a claim, what you're going to get come up is, a lot of things are going to make you wonder why you bought from that insurance company. It's called the reservation of rights letter. So insurance companies are publicly traded companies. They can't just voluntarily pay claims because they would be sued by their shareholders. But whenever you get a claim that comes in, they're going to put up a lot of things that say this could come in the way, this could come in the way. The reason they're doing that is because they really don't know much about your claim yet. So good brokers will tell you, ah, don't worry about that, That's just that's just like, an Italian family discussing over dinner. They're yelling at each other the whole time, just like my Croatian side of the family is. That's just normal talk. You just have to figure out when a, when something comes in that's material. Good brokers will have a pretty good clue on that. So what's uh, professional liability coverage about? Okay, so it starts with the application. And applications for professional liability, I will tell you this. We work with 46 insurance companies that have 46 different applications. When you're buying insurance for the first time, it's not, it's not just any insurance company application. It's what your business is about, what your mix of business is about, and the insurance broker picks the best application questions. If they know the applications well, they know there's differences between one application and another, and they pick the best application that we could plead your case to an underwriter to to get them to be interested in your firm at the best pricing. So you have to be kind of careful about which one you pick. And then when you get in there, and there's smaller firm applications and there's larger firm applications. Sometimes the small firm applications are absolutely terrible. They're more for convenience, but they don't get you a better price. So it might be worthwhile to fill out a larger firm application in, in some situations. So when you fill out an application, or the goal is to tap Max, you know, to uh, get your maximum available credits and contain debits. I talked about that a few times. That's huge. And then attachments to applications. I will tell you from working with regulators, there are many questions that an insurance company would like to ask. But when they work with a regulator and they turn in their premium and loss data, every question in the application, they have to show a correlation to the premium collected and losses paid. So an insurance company would love to know, if you work on residential, what percentage of your residential is ground-up homes versus additions and renovations. They would love to know that question, but unfortunately, the insurance companies don't keep track of that data, so they can't ask the question in the application. The regulators will not allow them to do it because they can't back it up with data. So what we do as good brokers is we make sure that we're, if you say you do custom single-family homes, we put a little note on there, you know, 60% additions, 20% ground up. Ground up is a heavier exposure than additions. So we get you a credit because your, your focus in residential is, is um, the lighter side of residential. That question's never asked in any application you'll see. Behind the scenes, when they see it, you can get a credit. Things like that are brokers, good brokers know these, these things and they help you get that done. So the application process, whenever I go through an application with somebody, we're worn out at the end. We've answered all of these questions and we're just about ready to commit Harry Carey. And that's where the most important question in the application is. 
When you renew your policy, by far and away, the most important question in the application is the last ones. It says, are you aware of any potential claims? It's so easy to say no. But if you really think about it, you need to think about it. I used to work for a company called Aon, 65,000 employees. When their insurance broker application was, was completed, you know, in, in most firms that have like 100 employees, it's the office manager that completes it, and they never, they never ask the employees on the firing line, are you aware of any potential claims? When I worked for Aon, anyone that was a vice president or higher in the company was handed a copy of the questions in that application. It was done at our, in our salary review, and we did answer those questions. And, and that way there, Aon was able to say that we asked the key people on the firing line, are you aware of any problems? And you, you can't document your file any more than that. So if you were to have a, a situation come up where after you buy your policy and the insurance company says, you knew about this claim, you can say, what more can we do than ask our employees the questions that we answered? We just didn't answer this by ourselves. We had a, the employees that were all principals in our firm look at these questions and answer these questions. You know what? Maybe they lied. But there's nothing more we can do than ask them those questions. So from a perspective of filling out these applications, these questions are really important, but you have to think about a little differently why, you know, how to answer those questions. If you're a small firm, it's just you. But if you're a little bit larger firm, make sure you answer, pass those questions around the office a bit. Another thing is that let's say that someone lied about a situation. You're, you might want to fire them, you know, because you all of a sudden found out they dragged you down this, this rabbit hole. Um, one thing that's good ammunition in case they resist your firing them, as you can say at my employee review, you said there were no issues. We found out there was. Goodbye. You're gone. This helps document your file, chases away an employment practice claim. Some, when employees leave your firm, guess what you ask them when they leave? These questions over again. Sometimes employees will leave because they know there's a problem that's going to blow up on them. So you want to know that right away. So ask them at, employee re at, at your regular reviews and if somebody leaves the firm. These questions are the last questions in an application. Sorry about spending time on that one, but I've just seen people's faces and I've heard the emotion on that, so that's why I spent a little bit of time on that, on that particular issue. So how is your pricing determined? Your pricing is determined based on your billings. There's a a formula on it. It's your average billings. There's a price per thousand dollars of billings. There's um, how far back in time your policy covers you. You know, you're in California. That's easy. But if you're in California and your other 20 states are in, you know, lower exposure states, your pricing would be higher for your California billings and lower for your other states. I've seen a lot of people that filed for insurance and they never broke out their their uh, billings on a state by state basis and they paid. 100% of their price based on the highest rate possible, which is the state of California. And 60% of their billings, let's throw an example, 60% of their billings were in Arizona. Arizona's rates are 30% less than California. So if you fill out your application and do business in Arizona, by God, break out those billings from Arizona, from California. Save yourself some money. Professional service factors. This is um, you're an architect, you're an interior designer, or you're a structural engineer. So when insurance companies put their pricing models together, everything's done based on two things. It's based on whatever an architect exposure is. That's just how they monitor what is the 1.0 factor and office buildings. That's 1.0. So, and that's also a, where a lot of their premium falls. So if you're an interior designer, interior designers don't, work on not they work on non-structural issues most of the time interior designers that that focus on interior design non-structural they get a 40 percent discount on the pricing of an architect because it's not structural involved their their claims exposures are lower i will tell you this when you fill out an application and you do some architecture work and you do some interior design work most insurance companies assume that that interior design work was connected to an architecture project and they ignore the credit for interior design because they they just have they just don't believe it. So when you fill out an application, like I actually drafted an application that an insurance company put together, 
where the interior design is shown, we have right below it non-structural. So if you fill in an application and you're both architect and engineer and you you know, put your percentage on an interior design, make sure you put a little comment on some, some attachment to that application that says, I filled out interior design. Everything in interior design is a start to finish interior design project and it's non-structural. That ensures that you get that 40% credit. Okay, when we get to project type um, factors, project type factors, office buildings are considered to be norm. I will tell you that when you look at these rate plans that I have, I have copies of most of them, you can get it if you know where to get it. Residential is a 20% higher price than office buildings are. And remember, this is all based on premium collected, claims paid. So the reason that residential is 20% higher by and large than, than um, office buildings is because they're emotion claims. Emotion claims, they, they, everyone has a friend who's a lawyer. Lots of times that friend who's a lawyer will write this complaint letter to you. And that lawyer may never represent them in court, but if there's just some lawyer's name on it, you have to take it serious. And they're hoping that you just cave and pay or your insurance company caves in and pays. So one company that we work out there has a lower loss ratio than, than uh, other ones do for residential. And I asked them, how do you do that? Because you're a pretty big company. Law of large numbers says you should be the same pricing. And the, the woman who ran the company said, here's what we do, John. We go into the internet. There's things that you can't get to unless you're a lawyer. And we find out the lawyers who's suing us, and we find out what their specialty area is. And if they have no experience in litigation over this kind of work, in other words, if they just do tax work, we call them up and we say, we understand you do tax work, so why are you dabbling in a professional liability lawsuit? Uh, we're not going to just bow down on this claim, so we suggest we think you probably did this as a favor for your client. So we should, we should counsel you right now that you need to back out of this and tell your client that they really need to hire a lawyer that has an understanding about this because this is going to go farther than just this letter you sent. And wh what they found out was inevitably that lawyer contacts their client and says, you got to hire an attorney. I can't, I can't do this anymore. I, I'm not experienced in this. And when they call some attorney up, the attorney says, that will be a 5000 or $10,000 retainer. All of a sudden, that person that's ready to you know, absolutely annihilate you becomes a friendly person and wants to work things out a bit. So that's why one company that we work with has a lower claims exposure than the other one for residential. I got news for you. I've been trying to pass that word to every other insurance company so their prices can go down too. But not everybody's adopted that tactic. You know, so when I'm talking about paparazzi, it's kind of knowing the ins and outs about why one company's lower in price. They'll tell you, you know, if you kick the tires hard enough. And that's one of the things I found out in that area. So there's clearly one company we work with that's better on residential than the other ones. There's, there's uh, what we call premium and, and debit modification factors. They, they differ by insurance companies. So everyone's got their little hot buttons that they can get. Like, um, you know, do you have written quality control manuals? Do you, um, do you use, how do you use BIM? for example, to use BIM versus other ones. They've, they've got these little questions that are, if you look at enough applications, you'll see that's a little bit different from any other ones. And it's nice to know what companies have more of these factors in place. Those are probably pretty good ones to go to because we've got more room for credits than other companies may have. Get into the next factor, claim history. This overly simplified way of thinking of claim history is if you have no claims, you earn a 15% credit on your policy. If you have claims, it goes up to usually no more than 15% debit on your policy. A lot of people think when they have claims that their pricing is going to go right through the roof. It's not the case. Pricing on these policies is not based on your you alone. It's based on the entire book of business and how it correlates to a 65% loss ratio. So the regulators come in and they say, look, at the maximum you can do is a 15% debit. If you don't like to live with somebody with a 15% debit, then they need to find a new insurance company, I guess. So if you have a full 15% credit and you have a serious claim, usually the maximum swing should be 30% officially on paper, 30% swing. So it's not as much of a premium increase as you might think. 
There's other ways that they can increase your policy premium too, but if you watch it, it doesn't really happen much more than that, okay? That's just how it works. Now, the loss history, if you have a 60% loss ratio, you're still getting a credit because they're expecting to have a 65% loss ratio. That's another thing people don't expect. So how do they analyze your your claim history with your premium? How do they analyze this? It's, it's usually, if you've been in business, five years worth of premium and five years worth of claims. Do that percentage. Now, because of the length of the speech, there are some companies out there that are are, are getting kind of creative on this. So for small firms, they realize that any claim is going to be a large claim. So a broker that knows that those plans are in place will go to those companies because for small firms, if they have a claim, they're going to go from a 15% credit to a debit like instantly. Your premium is $3,000. You've got an $18,000 loss. That's really a small loss, but that is a you know large loss ratio all of a sudden. So there are if the broker knows the companies that have it based on number of claims, not the size of the claims, we can maybe get better pricing for you. Not all companies do this, but there are some out there. And then there's the, your limit and deductible uh, factors. So most people in your business buy a, a million limit each claim and, and two, $2 million on an annual policy period basis. That's the normal. And that means it'll pay a maximum of $1 million on any one loss, but over the policy period, a maximum of $2 million. On the deductible, the deductibles are oftentimes zero for small firms. And the reason they're zero from the underwriters is not out of the goodness of their hearts. If you have no deductible, then you have to let them know of everything that goes wrong. So they get to inter intervene earlier on your behalf, and actually they save money. Most of them do save money by having a zero deductible than having a $5,000 deductible. There's a natural human tendency if you have a claim saying, oh, I think I can get this to go away before it's the $5,000 threshold's hit. So deductibles are... are uh, Low deductibles are a really good thing. I have some clients that tell me, you know, I've got a $5,000 deductible. I want to kick it up to 20000 And the first thing I'll say to them is, what kind of premium credit do you think you're going to get? And they'll think it's a lot. But realistically, if you have a $5,000 deductible, there's really not much of a meaningful premium credit until you go beyond 15000 Because if you think about it, the statistics in the industry are the, is that it, it it goes well over twenty five thousand dollars any claim that comes up. If depending on what statistics you follow, the average claim against an architect is one hundred and eighty thousand dollars. Now that's categorizing all types of projects. One hundred and eighty thousand dollars means payments for legal uh, defense costs and damage payments. If you're a structural engineer, it's six hundred and sixty thousand dollars. If you think about it, architect claims are more visible, and structural claims are more within the building. And they usually don't occur till later, so the building's done. It costs a lot of money to fix the problem. Part two of how pricing is determined. I'm going to stick with the bold-faced ones in here. This is sort of my reminder to not not go too long on speeches every now and then. But these are the important ones. So it's your mix of your clients. So underwriters like clients that are private clients and businesses. That's the norm for them. Where they get Larry is if you're hired by an owner acting as the builder. They're ducks out of water. They may not be super experienced, and I will tell you behind the scenes that a lot of them happen to be lawyers, and lawyers like to sue people. Be leery if you have a lawyer, if your lawyer is a project owner. They are, they are tougher clients. But the, tougher, the toughest ones are developers and contractors. And part of the reason for that is Developers and contractors have a tendency to force you to sign their own agreements. So if you're working with a developer or a contractor and you have to answer that question, but if you are able to use your own contract with the owners and developers, guess what? We can get this credit because that's unusual. That's a plus. And in the state of California, I don't know if you can see my arrow here, but in the state of California, they allow a 25% debit or credit, in other words, a 50% swing in your pricing based on how you run your business. These questions are so easy to answer in an application and just go on to the next one. You need to know to connect the dots on that. So hmm, project owners, developers, there's another question that says, what's your use of contracts? 
you answer that question. And um, the underwriter is going to automatically assume that if you answer the question about use of contracts, owner contract, they're going to assume that's from a construction contractor or developer, and you're going to get more hammered on pricing. But if you're lucky and with your develop your contractors and developers, you get to use your own contract, we need to let the underwriter know that. It helps you earn credits. Uh, type of projects. As I mentioned, uh, res custom single-family residential, 20% debit. Uh, there's some applications where it has like office buildings in there or buildings, and there's other ones that have buildings, and then they have office as a separate category. It would be so easy for you to answer buildings. You get a better price if it's office. An office is an office within the building. It's not the building. If you're working with an application, and the application does not have that office category, and you're forced to put it into office building because that's the only thing that makes sense, make sure you put a note on there that says, I don't do the building. It is in the building. It's an office within a building. And that helps in terms of getting this credit for the fact that you're a little bit different than what their assumptions are. An underwriter's assumption when they see buildings is it's the building, not the office in the building. So it's all how you have to connect the dots with how these questions get translated into pricing from an underwriter. Internal loss prevention, I, I didn't highlight that too much, but um, whenever you see an application, sometimes the application questions say, do you have written quality control manual? Yeah, one or two person firm. Why would you write a book to yourself? So when I answer that, when I tell my clients to answer that question, it's like, you don't have written ones. Why would you write something to yourself? You know, so yes, you do. It's in your brain. You're good at what you do. You loss prevent yourself. So when we answer that question, we answer yes to that question. And then we put a note on the application saying, we're a small firm. There's no reason to have written quality control, but we really do a good job of it. Or we have a subscription that we subscribe to. Why would we ever want to write it when our subscription is kind of like Wikipedia, con continuously being updated? Underwriters love that answer to a question, but for whatever reason, they still have a tendency to put written in there. I have good luck, good fortune every now and then of insurance companies calling me up and saying, where are we going wrong on our applications? <laughs> what? One of the things I say is, get rid of the word written. Who uses written anything nowadays? You know, most people don't even have books anymore. They're, they're reading them on, you know, their computers. So then we get into this next category of qualification on staff. You know, how many years have you been doing this business? There's a certain thing about a been there, done that mentality. Okay. And uh, so the longer that you've been in the business or the more relevance that you have to the type of projects that you work is something useful to do. So, You'll see sometimes where an underwriter wants your bio. They can, and the bio is so simple to say, I went to you know, Cal Poly. I have eight years at this company, eight years at that company. What you really want to say in your bio is forget that. You want to say, I've been in the business for quite a while. My focus is residential. Um, you know, I, and you just talk about how you think about managing that process, you know, about what your focal area is. Because, um, Anybody that's a good athlete is a good athlete because they practice, right? So you want to explain to them that you're, you practice a lot in the type of projects that you work with. It's more of a been there, done that mentality. That's what qualification of staff, that's where you get your maximum credit out of that. The last category is something that gets overblown too much, you know, that you're a member of the AIA, you're a member, you go to carrier insurance company seminars, you get your continuing ed. Well, you're supposed to get your continuing ed, so... Where continuing ed matters is if you're not an architect, because architects all have to get continuing ed, but if you're an interior designer and you're getting continuing ed, and believe it or not, structural engineers don't have to continue ed in California. I'm shocked by that. But to the extent that you're not required to get for your license continuing ed and you go about doing it, make a mountain out of molehill on that one. At least you get some of your credit that's there. And you can get that credit with, without being a professional society member. Now, the group that you belong to right now, that would qualify as a credit with most insurance companies. You know, so when you, when you, on your application, they might have AIA, ACEC, and they might have nothing to do with this group on there. Make sure they know because, and let, make sure they know they'll give you your credit for it. Not huge, but you might as well take advantage of it. What I'm doing right now is considered a carrier seminar. So good brokers with what they do, if they know that, you've attended a seminar put by somebody that knows what's going on in this business, they'll give you a credit for that, even if you don't have any of the other ones, because they know that somebody put in your mind, whether you're going to remember it or not, you know, exactly what they say. 
you're, you're going to think, somebody told me something about that. You know, and that's useful to avoid having claims. The last part of the process of, of debits and credits is use of written contracts. I'm going to minimize limitation of liability clauses because a good written contract has that in there already. And that how you manage your subconsultants if you have subconsultants. So written contracts is huge. So when you get into an application, you're going to see an app, the application will say you use association forms. Let's just simplify it, AIA contracts. Second one, do you use your own contract? The third one is do you use letter agreements? I will tell you that I people fill out that they use their own contract, and when I look at it, it's a letter agreement. Insurance companies have a tendency to think that letter agreements aren't necessarily as good as your own agreement. However, a properly put together letter agreement is actually better than probably a, a normal AIA agreement. So for small firms, what I recommend you do is have a scope of services letter. You can talk to the client the way you want to talk to the client, and then you have your standard terms and conditions that go on it, but you don't show them your standard terms and conditions until they want to do business with you. So you write the letter that a normal human being can understand, and when it comes time that they're ready to buy from you, then you change that. You say scope of services letter to scope of services letter, oh, agreement. By using the word agreement and a couple other little twists to, your, to your, um, your scope of services letter, then you latch on your standard terms and conditions. I see a lot of letter agreements that my clients put together that have standard terms and conditions within it. And when I have discussions with them, sometimes those are obstacles. So what I recommend is the things that are going to be normal boilerplate for you, you don't need to bring it up until they want to buy from you. So talk about what you're going to do for you in a letter agreement and then let your standard terms and conditions on it. I actually have underwriters knowing that a properly put together letter agreement is far better than your own company than your own company agreement. On separately insured subconsultants, if you're hiring, uh, let's say an architect hiring a structural or, or let's say an architect hiring an interior designer as examples, the one, your subconsultants should carry professional liability insurance. If they don't carry professional liability insurance, just know that if a claim occurs that your insurance policy does not cover them. However, your insurance company covers you to the extent you're found legally liable for what they do. If you're working with an uninsured subconsultant, it's it's kind of like a, a marriage and you break up. Someone says, uh, was that really my wife? Was that really my husband? I don't recognize them anymore. So your subconsultant, if they get named in the claim and they do not have insurance, a tactic used by people that are suing you, their attorneys, they'll call it the subconsultant, and they'll know pretty quick whether they have professional liability insurance. They've got that sixth sense they can tell. So if they're not insured, um, they get the fear of God put in their heart that they're going to lose everything. And you know what? That can really happen. So they get very cooperative with whoever's suing you. And all of a sudden, the subconsultant that you really like is no longer your friend. So hiring a subconsultant that has professional liability insurance allows them to not feel so threatened in that type of situation, and it really helps overall. The other thing is from your own background perspective is that they filled out that application. Theoretically speaking, an underwriter did some risk management. They thought about how they run their practice. They passed the test. They're probably, they probably are better than someone that doesn't buy insurance. When I was speaking at the American Institute of Architects National Convention in, in uh, New Orleans, I was on a flight back, and I was on with the Redwood Empire chapter chairman, and she was talking about how many architects do not carry insurance. And I don't know if you know this, but 40% of architects are uninsured. That's unbelievable. Unbelievable. You know, so when you hire a subconsultant, do ask for a certificate of insurance for what they have. That could be eye-opening. Secondly, when we get back to this contract topic, I, there's a speech that I do called use it or lose it. And what that means is that when you hire a subconsultant, you always want to have what your required insurance requirements are of them. And you always want to have in those insurance requirements that if a claim occurs in their professional liability insurer or whoever they buy their insurance from for commercial general liability pays a claim that they can, can't come back after you. So when you're hiring a subconsultant, you're, they're responding to your guidance 
So there's a higher frequency of the insurance company paying a claim and feeling that they paid a claim because you gave them dumb information. And the insurance company can subrogate, come back up against you to get some of the money they paid you know, to defend their subconsultant. When you hire subconsultants and you do it right, you put your insurance requirements out there, and there's certain things that you put in there. One is waiver of subrogation, and it has to be in writing, and then you'll never have that problem with your subconsultant. Hopefully I'm not running around too much you know, on this on this topic right now. I'm just trying to plan some things in your mind that I hope that you know it just somehow or another sticks in your mind when that subject comes up again. Uh, repeat clients. There's nothing like you know working with the same clients over and over again. You broke bread with them, kumbaya, good experience. I will tell you on applications they say are is over 50% of your billings from one client. That's a good and bad thing. The underwriters live in the world of gloom and doom. So most underwriters, because they pay claims, that's just how they're hardwired. They're nervous people. And so when you have over 50% with a client, you want to make sure that you explain. You don't just answer that question, yes. You put a little reply in there saying, I've worked with them for quite a few years. We get along, we get along very well. You know, just, just a little comment like that really helps because the underwriters, on the other hand, they interpret over 50% from a particular client to mean that that client can be the client from hell because they know they're your biggest client. They can be demanding. They can be absolute jerks, and you need them. They're too essential to your business. So that's one of the reasons why you, if you answer that question that way, you need to provide some extra information. That, that, that is not found as a potential answer to that question because the regulators don't allow it. If there's no actual statistics behind it, they can't ask the question. So a good broker, when you go through an application, will know how to answer that question if it's really true. And lots of times it is true. And that helps you get a credit versus a debit. A little bit into business office policies. Business office policies are the policy that nobody thinks they need because I work out of my house. As I mentioned before, you know, the four chapters in a book, job site liability is a big deal. So when you buy a business office policy, um, if you have a policy in place, the insurance companies like to see a little thing that says, I had no claims. You know, so just need a copy of your loss record from the insurance company, and it's usually pretty easy to get. The other thing when you think about business office coverage is make sure you know who you get your who your certs are for professional liability because you're going to match that for the BOP business office policy. But you're also going to have to cover all those certificate holders as additional insureds as well. So it's just a little advanced work. And then a special comment, same thing as professional liability. There's special outlined applications for architect and engineer firms. They make it a lot easier for you to figure out what you what you need or don't need. The industry has a tendency with this policy because the commission, once again, they're salespeople, right? Policy, your premium's like 700 bucks. How much time are they going to spend on that? So lots of times the broker will talk to you on the phone. They'll ask you a few questions, and then they'll get a quote for you. Something mysteriously comes up. Do you know whether it's the right number or not? Yeah, you assume it is. But if you see a right kind of application, you make that you might have answered questions differently. So a broker that has a specialized application for your business is a big plus. So the key coverage limits, commercial general liability, it's the same as your, your uh, professional liability. It's, it starts at a $1 million each claim, $2 million aggregate limit. There's some coverages that this is where it starts to become kind of real. I, I like people to buy policies and appreciate why they buy it rather than I'm buying it because somebody requires us to buy it. So if you're in an office, there's general liability coverage, and then there's this crazy limit called damage to premises rented to others. What the heck is that? So the way your commercial general liability helps you, not with related to your office, is if a fire occurs in your office and it never leaves the four walls of your company, this is your damage to premises rented to others liability. I will tell you that in a non-architect and engineer program, this is usually a two or 300000 limit, which may or may not be enough. But in an architect and engineer program, that's a million-dollar limit. You're not paying anything different. You're just getting it because that's just a, a thing that they take care of for you. So a million dollars can go a long ways towards paying to, you know, a fire loss inside your building, inside your office. The minute that leaves your office, smoke goes into other offices. 
sprinkler system goes off, water goes down two floors, smoke goes up a couple floors, damage above. That's where your commercial general liability comes into play. This is where it helps you personally and nothing to do with your clients. Um, it, it, property damage pays for if your building gets burned down your commercial and you're a renter, this, this, prop, this uh, commercial general liability policy will pay to replace that building. So when you just blindly buy this $1 million each claim, $2 million aggregate, and you're in a building that's worth $5 million, you may want a little more. Because if you had a fire, it could be more than a million-dollar loss. I'm, I'm just trying to personalize this policy about how you think of it more than just you know, your clients themselves. But when you really dig into the kick the tires on this, these, these things become a little more of a discussion point. And it's just not an expense for you anymore. It's something that is important to you. The last part of it is called non-owned and hired auto liability. And what this means is that you drive your person, essentially it means you drive your personal vehicles for company purposes. When I worked for Aon, very large firm, I could not drive my personal auto without having a minimum policy limit in place. And it had to be higher than the norm. So let me give you a little statistics. The way this policy comes into place, I'll give you a good example, because we paid plenty of these claims when I was an underwriter. We have a meeting at 10 o'clock. We agree to a meeting at 10 o'clock. You're in your car driving to the meeting at 10 o'clock. You, you hit somebody going 40 miles an hour. You rear end them. If you hit somebody 40 miles an hour and they're not moving too much, generally speaking, it's a pretty safe bet that it's a $300,000 neck injury. The most common sold policy in the state of California is a 100000 limit if there's one person in the car and 300000 for more than one person in the car or more than one vehicle in an accident. So if there's only one person in the car and you hit them going 40 miles an hour, you're out of pocket $200,000. So if you have a 100000 limit for your auto policy, get it increased. Talk to your broker about it. Get it increased. That will protect you. Now, owned auto comes into play. And this is your employees driving their personal vehicles. You like your employees, give them some advice about what they should carry. You know, you want them to be around for a while. I have companies that give targeted bonuses just to increase, that's dedicated to getting that auto limit up to something responsible. They're actually doing a favor for their clients, you know, for their employees by doing that. But not on auto, the way this comes into play is your, your employees driving to a job site or you're driving to a job site. You get into an accident and it's a serious accident. The attorney calls up where you were going to visit and the attorney says to your client, I understand you had a meeting with John Feeney today and he didn't show up. Uh, I'm the attorney because John hit somebody when he was driving to your office and I understand that he had to be there at uh, 10 o'clock and if he could have been there and it, that was pretty much carved in stone and if he could have been there at 11 o'clock um, we wouldn't have this accident and all of a sudden your, your client's thinking bloody hell why am I getting dragged in a lawsuit over how you drive your car? So not owned and hired auto, when you have it on your policy, if your client calls you up, you can say, don't worry, you're covered under my policy. Because when you get that coverage, it, you put an additional insured on there and your client's covered. That's where this becomes important. Where it becomes important if you have employees. If you get into an accident, they're going to subpoena your cell phones. They're going to know whether you were on the phone when you got in an accident. They're going to know whether you were text messaging while you were driving. They're going to know whether there's a pattern of text messaging while you're driving, while you were checking, while you're doing Facebook or whatever you were doing. It's all discoverable from your cell phones. So your company could get named in a suit for not having a thou shalt not use our cell phone while driving your car. So this coverage is something that one of the ways you can kind of prevent it or minimize it is you have a policy, you know, that employees sign that they're aware. Turn over to the side of the road if you're going to look at your text messages. They may not. But when you get named in a lawsuit for an employee that just violates that, at least your company is not on the hook for that so much. Your clients all want this non-owned and hired auto liability because they never want to be named in, this, in a lawsuit. This is something that's easy to skip, but it's something that's very important for your business. In the application process for business office, it's just doing a, you know, figuring out what your property is worth. So because of, of time here, most people don't own their buildings. They're a tenant. So business personal property is what your desk, wall units, things like that are. Computers are your computers, your, um, your, anything related to your computers, printers, scanners. And in business office policies, and a relatively new coverage that's coming into play is uh, information privacy and security coverage. And that covers virus and ransomware. In the olden days, these policies used to cover what they call valuable papers. 
And in the olden days, it was true. Architects and engineers produced a lot of paper. They were called blueprints sitting all around the office. Now they're electronic blueprints. So in a good business office policy, you can not only get your, your liability taken care of in your desk and your wall units and your computers, but you can also get good coverage in case you get hit with a virus. I will tell you that if you get hit with a virus, chances are you were hit with a virus three to six months ago, and it doesn't activate until it happens. So great, got it stored in the cloud. Go up to the cloud, download it, and the virus that was not active but has been there for three to six months activates again. So in a business office policy, something that's really overlooked is not getting proper um, ransomware and virus coverage. I call it information privacy and security. So under this policy, this makes it a little more meaningful when you understand some of the components that are in it. So if you get hit with this, you can contact your insurance company and they can go in and find out where that crazy virus is in the, in the cloud and take care of it. And if they can't take care of it in a timely basis, they also know where to get bitcoins and how to pay somebody in some foreign country in bitcoins before they completely destroy your system. For anyone that's a, a landscape architect, they're going to have some field equipment, and some field equipment could be also gets added on these policies. There's different ways of dealing with it, but um, that's something that if I have a landscape architect, we talk in more detail about. Um, these are some of the other coverages that come into play. As I mentioned with business office policies, the little surprise coverage in there is that data privacy. Well, you can also get employment termination coverage. It's called employment practices liability. Most people think about employment practices liability as when someone leaves. Let me tell you this. If you're in business, how often do you get someone applying for, for, a, for a job? How you tell somebody that you don't have an opening, sometimes there's professional appliers for jobs. And they go around and, they, and, you, and you get trolled. And then all of a sudden an attorney says, I'd like to see your records. Um, we understand that you were interested in hiring people. No, I, I wasn't interested in hiring people. But you, did you hire anybody in the last year? Yeah, I hired one person. Well, we want to see the records of all the people you, you looked at. And how did you tell them that there wasn't a job opening? You know, so you have to be careful about that. Um, with there's a, a claim out there now where your employee terminates themselves and then they see you afterwards. It's called constructive termination. In other words, you didn't recognize how good they were on their job. They were going no place, so they had to leave the job. But they left the job under duress because you weren't allowing them to, to prosper. So when they leave the job, they turn around and see you because they were just suffering so much emotional distress while working for you that your employment practices drove them crazy and they want to get some money back. So the lawsuit that comes into play from that is that, one, they're not like they're going to allege that they were out of work for so long. They want to be paid for that period of time. Two, they're going to allege that their new employer probably isn't paying them as high as you were, so they're going to want to make up for the difference in it. And three, they lost a bonus maybe from you because of that or a potential bonus. So there's a lot of allegations that come in employment practices liability. You can get this kind of coverage under this policy really cheap. If you're a small business and you buy a separate employment practice policy, it's light years more expensive. So I'm going to skip this, this uh, how property coverage is applied. In terms of broker proposals, obviously most broker proposals show you what your limit and deductible is. They, they may or may not mention whether your deductible doesn't apply to legal defense costs. That's called first dollar defense. They should. Uh, the policy should, the broker proposal should list what firms are covered because in this business with professional liability, if your name was uh, John Feeney, architect and you change your name to, to John Finney Architect Incorporated, that's a different name. So on your policy, you always have to show all the variations of the name of your company. You might be John Finney Design doing business as Finney Design. You need, to, you need to list those ways that you list your company on professional service agreements so there's no doubt about if a claim comes in that, that, that the insurance company is aware of the name of your claim at that point in time. With um, professional liability policies, you get a credit if you're a first-time buyer because you have no coverage for any work you did in the past. Generally, that's a 25% credit. And so as time goes by, if you did nothing different, that 25% credit goes away because they're covering you for two years the next year and three years the next year and four years the next year so that there's a credit when you first buy your policy that slowly goes away. There's very important things in policies of which I just highlighted one of the most important. It's called consent to settle. Heaven policies have consent to settle. That means that 
you can protect your reputation longer if a claim comes into play and you get named in a lawsuit and the um, insurance company says we can settle this lawsuit for $150,000 and you're like, bloody hell, this isn't worth $150,000. You can actually not be forced by the insurance company to have to pay that claim. You know, you kind of know the situation oftentimes better than the insurance company does. So consent to settle provisions, if you're not aware of what's in your policy and your broker hasn't brought that up, you need to ask that question. Um, Number of years of extended reporting period, that's only important if you're going to retire. So if you're ever going to get near going out of business, taking a job somewhere else, make sure that your policy has at least five years period of time to buy protection if you shut your business down. So there's a lot of people right now that might have formed their own practice for a period of time, might be tempted to take a job when the economy gets better and go work for somebody else. But when they shut down their practice, they they better know that on the going out the door, they need to buy this kind of thing in case a claim comes up after they shut their business down. And the number of years is critical in that point. But it's only important if you think you're going to leave your business in the next year. And then uh, policy premium options. I'll tell you this. If you want a $1 million limit, always ask for a $2 million limit too. It would just be your luck during the year that you're going to have some client that says, yeah, $1 million limit's not enough. You've got to have a $2 million limit. So if an insurance broker is getting a quote from two or three insurance companies, you might find glaring differences in the cost of that $1 million limit versus two. So by asking for two higher limits, you're kind of setting the stage for, you know, one company's like, you know, cheaper for the $1 million limit, but that other company that's the one company that's cheaper is a heck of a lot more expensive for the $2 million limit. So you might make a decision that, you know, that I might have a project where $2 million limit comes up. So by knowing what the cost is of a higher limit, you can position yourself, you know, to make that decision, maybe to pay a little bit more because you're going to pay less when that other project comes in where you have to have a higher limit. Plus, there are projects that you may have not bid on because you just felt a $2 million limit was too expensive. You never asked the question about how much a $2 million limit cost. So if your broker goes and gets that extra limit, at least you know what the cost would be. So maybe you say, yeah, I can bid on that project. It's not that expensive to buy this extra limit. So good brokers will explain on your premium, how is it priced? It's not just it's $1,000 this year and it's 3000 the next year. You know, one, it's based on your increase or decrease in average billings. This is something a lot of people don't necessarily know, but insurance companies take your average of your last three years with the billings, add them together, divide by three. So your last year's policy is based on 2019, 18, 17 billings. This year's policy is 2020, 18, 19, 2017 billings drop off. So if your business, if your policy has been shopped properly, it's just a function of a per thousand dollar rate. If you're with the right insurance company, then your premium would go up if your billings increased. On the other hand, your billings should go down if your premiums, if your billings went down. That's something that's not pointed out in policies too often. That's where you have to know the science behind the scenes. Uh, thing that's a little lesser importance is this AM best rating. A lot of people have heard about it. You know, I like that A plus rating. Well, AIG insurance company was A double plus when they went out of business. So the, they just have to have a sufficient AM best rating. They don't have to have a ridiculously good one. You, the more, What's more important is how they handle claims and their pricing and their experience. Um, insurance brokers also do, I touched on this a bit, insurance brokers will look at your contracts and try to make them insurable. So, you know, your your broker, whoever you're working with, should give some opinion about what they do for contract reviews. And it's not acceptable, in my opinion, that if they just say the insurance company does it. Insurance companies don't do a real good job of it. So your your broker should do contract reviews. And if you're not sure about it, ask them, send them one of your contracts and say, can you give us an opinion on this? Just show them it and hear them talk about issues in your contract. And you know pretty quick whether they're making things up or whether they really know what's what the exposures are and how your contract's drawn up. Um, there's little subjectivities to buying coverage, you know, so like you need to um, send them a no known claims letter. You need to send them your bio. Um, you want to have no surprises. So in your proposal, it's, you want to make sure you know exactly what you need to do to get that policy in place so you can get your certificates out to your certificate holders and not have them chasing you down because you haven't gotten your policy finished yet. A lot of companies have payment plan options. So in your, in your proposal, it should outline all payment plan options available. Most of them are interest-free. This is just sort of a high level of things that at least I consider when we put our proposals together to let you know how one company stacks up versus another one. 
I won't talk about business office because I've gone over my time. I apologize about that. Uh, changing insurer checklist. You know, just you have to think about that policy form. Does it make sense for you? Um, once again, we talked about, you know, what's what's the pricing for the limit you're buying and how much more is it going to be for a higher limit if you have a project that comes into play in the future? Um, do you have any idea about the insurer's appetite that if you decide to go from um, office buildings to more residential or if you can't turn down a project on a, a small amusement park or a playground or something like that, what's their opinion on it? Um, you need to know whether they're going to stick with you and what their price difference is going to be. So if you think in the next year that you might take on a, you know, some kind of renovation within an LAX airport, which a lot of my clients were doing, uh, some insurance companies are going to price it a lot more than, than others. So your broker, when they're negotiating coverage, can run a, taste, a test by the insurance company, and then you'll get an idea of what your premium would do or whether they even want to insure you if, by doing that. So kind of holding your divining rod out for what you may do in the future and having your broker touch bases with the insurance companies that you're looking to maybe move with because you're making a decision among a couple companies will help you. Uh, we talked about that. Make sure all business names are listed on the policy. Make sure that you, if you have, you know, survey and make sure that you know if there's any, you know, problems out there. If there's any problems, you do not switch insurance companies. You stay where you're at. And um, insurance company relationships, it's kind of hard to talk to the insurance company, but they all hold little webinars and seminars. And usually they have a registration form and that they know you've attended these registr these uh, webinars they've got in their records, and that helps you earn a credit because they've seen that you've attended these webinars. Whether you fell out of your chair sleeping when the webinar was going on or not, they just got your name that you attended it. Usually the, there's some pretty good webinars out there. And, you know, it's not, it's not ridiculous to say, I'd like to talk to my underwriter. Could you send a conference call up? You know, most people don't think about that. These people don't, you know, they're, when you go to an auto dealership, you never, the auto, the, the salesman's talking to you, right? And whenever a tough decision is, they go, they have to go to the back room to talk to the person you can never see. Well, that's the underwriter. Underwriters are human beings. They can talk once in a while. If the underwriter's in uh, visiting LA, you know, just say, hey, I'd like to, if the underwriter's got some time, I'd like to, you know, meet them. I could meet them at breakfast. I could meet them at lunch. Or if they can stop by my office, you know, you might find that they'll do that. That means a lot to a lot of people. And then you could also send, you know, if you know your underwriter's email address or you know something about their company, put them on your mailing list about what you're doing. I like that. Get to know a little bit about you. So I am on LinkedIn. You could connect with me on LinkedIn very easily. And I appreciate the time tonight. I don't know how many people were on this call, but, you know, the ones that were on it hopefully got something out of it. And if they didn't get anything out of it, you know, hopefully they know I actually care about what I do. <laughs> It's, uh, my, my wife you, says I should be a little briefer, but she says, no, you actually care about what you do. Sometimes you go overboard, but uh, I'm just trying to keep you in business. And that's what most brokers do. They really do want to keep you in business. Thank you. I think we did have a couple of questions. Um, well, actually, uh, Shumetta and I both had questions. I don't know. Um, okay. but if you, if uh, people can't stay, that's, that's great. Everyone seems to have made it this far. Um, we all appreciate um, John's time. So thank you. I'll just thank you right now. Um, thanks very much. Thank <laughs> uh, I had a question. Um, you were talking about um, on applications when the um, when you've got a question about potential claims. What's an example of that kind of thing? Like it, it seems so vague. You know, sometimes you just yeah. I don't know what we're worriers so sometimes like i'm maybe worried but like what what does it what is what kind of things would somebody put well being a catholic boy there's venial sins and there's mortal sins so what we're talking about is venial sins here they're the, they're the small sins so i call it i also call it beating the war drums so let's say that you're you're on a project and somebody's upset and you're like i don't know where this is going to go mm -hmm. that's a good time to talk to your broker and there's a thing called a pre-claim where the insurance company gets involved to try to help you not worry so much while those things are going on. It doesn't cost you anything. They they blow in your ear. They might hire an attorney. They might just help you out in a way. And the insurance companies all do this. And I will tell you from having been in the business for a while that before the insurance companies had this pre-claim helping you, 
they used to pay 14 claims out of every 100 projects. When they had the pre-claim intervention, they reduced the claims from 14 down to nine. Historically speaking, so they save money. So it's, even if it's break even, you know, it's, it's what's right for their clients. But historically speaking, out of every 100 projects that you enter into, 20 will be situations where someone's beating the wardrobes. Yeah. You know, so it's the Clint Eastwood thing. Do I feel lucky today? <laughs> you know, when he's pointing a gun at you and he's got one, maybe one bullet in there. Um, you know, so if you have someone that's that's um, upset, that's the time to talk to your insurance company. It's also a time to kind of show off to your insurance company. One, you're thinking about not handing them a nightmare. Two, they'll get an idea that you actually care about your business. They love that. And, and three... Um, you know, you're going to learn a little more if this goes away, that if it ever comes up again, that it might not come up again because you learned from this situation that came up in the first place. Yes. Does that answer okay. your questions? That does. Yeah. Thank you. That's great. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's more. Um, Shemetta is asking, if you get a really big job that requires more insurance, can you update an existing policy or do you need a new policy? Um, I keep mentioning the insurance regulators regulate insurance companies. So there is a ceiling in terms of what limit you can buy from your current insurance company. And what that means is the insurance co most insurance companies can offer a 5 million limit, but if you're a small firm, you won't be able to get a 5 million limit from your insurance company. And here's the reason why. At some point, the premium for that extra million might be $500. And your insurance company say five hundred dollars for a million dollar exposure. Sorry, not going to do it. Mm -hmm. So at that point in time, we would have to, as your broker, go to another company to get a higher limit. Those companies aren't regulated the same way by the insurance departments, and it would like, for example, Travelers. They're regulated by the insurance company. They could write a five million limit, but they can't do it. However another company that's not regulated quite the same way as travelers, they can do an extra two or three million on your policy. It'll be more than five hundred dollars, but at least you'll be able to get that limit. Yeah. So you wouldn't you know, so this, you wouldn't lose a job, you know, if someone says, Well, I no. need this much you know insurance, you would still be able right. to Okay, that's good. Okay. A good trend in the market right now is that in the in the olden days the if you had to go to another insurance company for a limit they wouldn't do any higher limit than what your current policy was. Mm. But lately there's some insurance companies, if you have a 1 million limit, we can get another three from a, a different insurance company. The going rate right now is about uh, $1,200 to $1,500 per million, you know, which could be higher for those $3 million than your current policy is right now or certainly matching it. But you also can't get that job without having that amount. You know, and $1,500 for a million dollars, that's actually not a bad trade-off when you think about it. Okay. All right. Well, there's an additional question to that same question. Um, if you, um, to, to tack on to that one, can you add a uh, project-specific policy? Um, so say you, you've gotten a new type. Think of it differently. Um, it's called a project. There's a project-specific policy in the insurance underwriting world is a good example of it is the Bay Bridge in San Francisco. The, the, the government body bought a policy, a project policy, and they covered the entire design team under that policy. Um, I think they bought a hundred million limit and all the architects and engineers shared that limit. That's called a project policy. You really can't buy a project policy that's anywhere near affordable. So under your current professional liability policy, you can buy what we call a project specific limit and that's a limit that increases your, if you have a 1 million limit for your entire practice, that's a shared limit for all your projects. And you can buy an extra million that's dedicated only to that project. And sometimes that's cheaper and sometimes it's not cheaper. So what I mean is that sometimes that limit for a project limit, it's only useful for one project and you might pay the same premium just to increase your overall limit to 2 million, which is relevant for all your clients your holders. So anytime you need a, an extra limit like that, your, your broker should explore um, getting it dedicated for that one client and then compare that with the limit being available for your entire practice. I'm um, going to refine this question a bit. There 
our industry is famous for playing games with your mind. So this is just one of those ideas where they do that. So you get this project limit for one project. There's also, if you think this client that you have this, where you have to buy this higher limit, if you think you're going to have more than one project with that client, you can buy what we call a client-specific limit. So you can buy this extra $1 million limit, and it applies to all projects that you may do with that client. Saves you money, you know, than having to buy a separate limit for every one. Yeah. That's cool. Okay. Uh, we've got two more questions if you've got time, John. All right. I think we've... We're in COVID times. I, you know, <laughs> okay. where am I going to go? <laughs> Walk the dog well, around I the block. I so appreciate that. Thank you very much. Sure. Okay. Um, Sona is asking, um, how can I get coverage for the first few projects I had when I started and didn't have insurance then? <laughs> Heaven companies. Heaven companies. Okay. So, yeah, it's not the purgatory of hell companies. So there's a few insurance companies out there that if you go claims-free the first year, when you renew your policy, they'll cover you back to the date you started your practice. Now, from a technical point of view, they are more expensive as an insurance company, and I used to develop rates. So theoretically speaking, if you buy from that type of – let's say you're a first-time buyer. If you buy from a company that has that benefit, their pricing is going to be about 15% higher than one that doesn't do that. Behind the scenes, there's a reason why they do that. But when you buy that type of policy, um, it's it's really nice to know that, you know, I've been doing this for a while, and I could actually recoup my, my, uh, my lost prior acts. When the economy was in the tank, there were a lot of uh, firms that just couldn't afford their insurance anymore. Isn't it nice to know that if, once you get back to the point again where you can do it, if you buy from one of those companies, you can get that? But I would tell you out of the 46 companies that are out there, I only know six to do it. So it's not many. Oh. Okay, great. And then um, one more. Uh, Liana asks, um, she says, thank you for your expertise. Do you have any recommendations for particular policies? So she's asking particularly a professional liability insurance. Oh, well, the Heaven Company. <laughs> you know, so... Heaven companies, um, the ones that are the heaven companies, at least at this point in time, is um, in terms of cover, in terms of pricing, the heaven companies are like Hanover Insurance Company. They don't have the provision in there that if you go claims free one year, that they go back, you know, for forever. But the uh, they're a really good company. They're the ones that have figured out how to handle residential claims. Their pricing is is definitely really good for residential versus some other companies that just don't have the same loss experience. Uh, another company out there is Travelers. I mentioned their name a couple times. And there's another company called Navigators, which just got purchased by the Hartford. They're not a huge player in architects and engineers, but you know, I'm like paparazzi, right? They got purchased by Hartford. Hartford's going to pump money in them. They're going to have a good policy, trust me, shortly. They're, they're almost there. Great American is another insurance company that offers that kind of coverage. And that's about where it ends. Not too many. And being a paparazzi person, I will tell you that the reason those companies all have that is they all worked for one company at one point in time. Their brains were aligned that that's how that company does it. So therefore, at their new company, that was just normal practice. And you'll find that pretty much every one of those companies is between Baltimore and Washington, D.C., because they all used to work at the same place. So thank God that one of the companies came up with that concept and the other ones mimicked it. Otherwise, we probably wouldn't have that. Okay. Um I don't know, um, Shumetta, do you want to wrap up and say anything? I'd like to just mention a couple of upcoming programming events um, after you're good. Oh, no, this was so great, John. I, I appreciate you so much because, you know, this is, you know, there's the fun, creative stuff that we get to do, but then there's the the nuts and bolts, you know, and I've, I've just heard over the years, so many architects will say, you know, you know, very successful, they'll say, you know, someone that they went to school with was, more talented than that than they were, but they were a better business person. So this is, I feel like this is the nuts and bolts of understanding the business that allows us right. to then be the creative people that, you know, that we want to be. So I appreciate your time and, and detail. I, I, yeah. 
Thank you. I don't expect my clients to memorize all this stuff. I expect them to be somewhat overwhelmed by it, but hopefully they realize that, holy smokes, there's a lot to think here. So it, it's usually pretty nice if your insurance broker is reasonably good at what they do. You don't have to remember all this stuff. You just have to say, you know, you just have to think, God, this is something I should call them, you know, and well, just discuss it. And then they'll trigger something. You guys know, like it, when he said, like, by the end, like, you know, you want to commit carry carry, like on one of our calls, like I literally was in tears. <laughs> it was yeah. just so hard. <laughs> But I'm so thankful, mm -hmm. you know, because when something came up, I'm like, okay, it was worth it. I now I now I know why he was putting me through all of that because you need to know for it to be, you know, the best possible solution for you. So. Right. I, I don't know if this came up in that discussion, but when you and I worked on your contract, a lot of contracts have in their uh, termination, and yeah. I'm a big proponent of suspend then terminate. Suspend is the same thing as terminate. Oh, yeah but it doesn't get people so upset. You're suspending because they didn't pay you. You're suspending because they're in breach of what they should do for you. You're holding the door open to, to work together again. And, and it makes it easier when you eventually invoke the termination clause to not be sued. Yeah. Can I get, let me give you one recommendation. My, my, whenever I do a speech and someone asks me, you know, what's the one thing that we should do? My recommendation is that you should get incorporated. And then if someone asks me, what's the next thing you should do? I'll say, remember my first thing. So the reason why getting incorporated is so important is because you, you buy a professional liability policy. You are personally liable for what you do. Pers here's what personal liability means. If you get hit with a claim and you don't have insurance or you don't have enough insurance, they can tap into, you can be forced to sell your home. Historically speaking, they don't take all your savings. They take 50% of your savings. The third thing that happens after that is they put a lien on your earnings based on your historical earnings. And, if, and there's a certain period of time with a fixed dollar amount that you need to meet. And if you don't meet that, they have the option to extend it longer. It doesn't happen that often, but why risk it? So when you get incorporated, just being incorporated does not protect you, but you can contractually protect yourself. So the first step is get incorporated. The second step is putting a, a good waiver of personal liability in there. I will tell you that my version of recommended version for waiver of personal liability changes about every four or five months because think of lawyers are like rats. Any rat can chew through a quarter inch piece of plywood. So once we find some rat that chews through one part of that, of a provision, we try to put a patch in there and uh, waiver of personal liability. It just, if it's worded right, um, it means that they can't take your whole business away. And what's your most valuable asset in your business? It's your professional liability policy. So, you know, for me, I don't want my wife chasing me around with a baseball bat. She's she's pretty good with that. So if I have a waiver of personal liability, I'm I'm shielding myself from bodily harm for for um, getting incorporated, but not remembering to put a waiver of personal liability in the agreement. We have language for that, you know, for you. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, John. Um, I just wanted to say um, a couple things that we've got coming up since we're all here. Um, AWAD, as you know, many of you know, um, does events many times a month, and this month we've got tons going on, so I just wanted to announce we have a book club on the 25th. We're reading Cadillac Desert. Um, we have a, uh, a new monthly event that um, Sona, who's attending, is um, managing, and it's called the Self-Employed Business Owner Group Morning Coffee, and uh, it's a time to get together to talk and share stories and inspiration, and it's in the morning. So um, check that out on our website. That's going to be monthly. So please come along and enjoy that with us. Also, we have a monthly sketching happy hour starting um, on the 28th of this month. That's gonna be close to the end of the month, every month. So join us for that. And then, uh, let's see, and then we've got a, a, oh, I've almost forgot. We had we have experienced professionals, cocktails and conversations. That's um, Wonderful. That's every month also. Uh, on the 20th, that's happening. So six days from now, uh, many of you already know this, but um, if you've got 10 years or more of experience, it's the time to get together, share stories, and, um, you know, really just maybe vent a little bit, but also, you know, feel renewed by your colleagues who are going through similar things. So um, anyway, uh, our website's full of all this stuff coming up, and we hope to see you at another event soon. 
Thanks, everybody. Meta, you never Thanks, saw my John. dog before. There's, there's John. Mojo. Yes. Oh, so Hi, cute. Hangs out, Hi, hangs out with me all the time. <laughs> He's laying by me the whole time, so I 